Welcome to the midweek edition of the Sportsline Podcast here on CHCH. Hey, we hope that we are becoming a regular part of your daily routine. I'm your host, Bubba O'Neill. Folks, the depth of talented athletes, coaches, broadcasters, and executives in the Golden Horseshoe, I say it time and time again, it's endless. Today, a hard worker that has enjoyed success in the classroom, on the gridiron, on the hardwood, and now the links. Well, leadership has come easy to this Hamiltonian, who's the pride of Barton's secondary high school. If there was an opportunity to learn, Brian Crawford has taken on the challenge. Nicknamed as the Crawdaddy from the one and only Michael Pinball Clements, a seven-season CFL career opened doors for a number of business opportunities. With the CFL Players Association, OUA, Canada Basketball, and Golf Canada. Brian, how are you, bud? It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah, good doing well. See, good to see you. I'm, I'm really glad that you joined us. I mean, I think about when I first met you and the things that you've done in your career, and, I, and we outlined just a couple there. There's been so much and so much growth and what you have gone through. And I, I, in some ways, you got to be certainly proud of what you've done. And there's so much, I guess, for you still to do. I guess that's, uh, I think, the way we can't tend to generate our interest and keep us going. But, uh, boy, you know. Take me back. I mean, okay, you, you, you're drafted in, I think, the, what, the fifth round in the CFL. You start to play for the Argonauts. Football, was that the dream, original? No, I mean, I was a hockey player originally. Mm-hmm. Grew up playing in the, the Hamilton uh, AAA system and uh, you know, we were the Huskies at one point in time and then the reps for a lot of that. And so, yeah, I grew up a hockey player mm-hmm. uh, up till kind of uh, about grade 11. And uh, just uh, I played across the street here from the studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the uh, McCoys, mm-hmm. even one one season uh, in junior. So, uh, yeah, it was hockey and baseball uh, growing up, and um, and uh, kind of, you know, hockey kind of got a little bit uh, a little bit challenging uh, for me, and just wasn't loving it anymore, and wanted to just uh, you know play sports with my friends and. Mm-hmm. I went to a high school that had a great, you know, uh, football program, and and uh, I'd run track for a long t- for a number of years and, and such with the high school team and, and with a club team, uh, HOC in Hamilton, and and uh, decided to just go for football. My father had been a football coach, uh, had coached at Ancaster High School mm-hmm. for for years, kind of in the '80s, and and um, yeah, one thing led to another, and. At one point, uh, a decade later, my wife's like, eh, I think it's time to pack this football thing in, don't you think? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, it, it was a tremendous journey. It took me to a great uh, school at Queens and, you know, somewhere where I, I don't think I had probably ever thought I would I would end up mm-hmm. uh, for university. And um, you know, I met a lot of amazing people along the way. And it was a, a great start, you know, in life to get the chance to to do that for a living. I talk to every football player that has come here on this couch and they talk about the sport so glowingly and their days as a football player and the the unity that you get the brotherhood that you get I guess practicing and playing the wins and losses can you get into depth about what that was like playing with the Argonauts for those years yeah absolutely I mean I was really fortunate for you know a majority of my time you know we had very good teams really really good teams you know it was uh, kind of the my final year in the league was uh, our team was not great um, you know, so, so you do had, you know, I did experience some of those challenges, but you know, it, it is such a unique sport, um, you know, in the team mentality of the, of the sport, like every player has a job to do and has a, has an assignment and, and, um, you know, there are no kind of individuals, um, to the extent that there maybe are in other sports, uh, like basketball or something like that. Like, of course, you know, great players can change games, but you know, a quarterback's not completing <laughs> touchdown passes mm-hmm. if his offensive line isn't blocking for him and, and so forth. So, you know, it's, it, uh, you know, this was a, <laughs> this was a, a special moment to score. Uh, that was the game winner at the Labor Day class. 2008 buddy and uh you know that was that was pretty cool to 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 do that at home and you know I, I was called a lot of things down at Iverwin in those years especially those who figured out that I was you know a Hamiltonian playing for the hated Argos but <laughs> um but yeah and when you retire like those are the that's the stuff you kind of miss the most is the you know the locker room time the with the guys the time on the road with the guys like you know you don't miss training camp mm-hmm. I can tell you that and training camp usually is the thing that leads most guys to be like I'm not doing this another year but um, that's where the American players have problems with their visas. Oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing this again. But you know, it's um, and it's tough. It, it's a tough challenge for any 
professional athlete, any any athlete at any high level that when their, mm -hmm. you know, competitive uh, playing career comes to an end to transition away from that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of us that, you know, have the chance to play at a high level, you know, have done it for a long time and in and, and multiple sports for, mm -hmm. for many of us. And so when that really does come to an end, there's, there's a big hole and a void for people to fill. And, you know, during my time in the players union, we spent a lot of time on trying to help with the transition of players uh, right. to the next level. And, you know, we played in a league where you, you make a great living, no question about it, but you know you're not making the living that you can you know retire on for the rest of your life so to speak and and i even would say that most guys that make that, that kind of money that uh, play in those sorts of leagues none of them retire for good they're too they're too wired you know to uh to achieve things and and they're too driven to to just flat out retire so it's a tough transition for people and and um you know i was fortunate that you know i think i did it about as well as as you could uh, could have asked to have done it well, you, I, you have to play to understand that, and you're right. I hear that time and time again from so many former players about your life is so regimented, playing sports, practice here, game day here, lift weights here, meetings here, video here, and then when that's all gone and no one's telling you what to do, basically, now what do I do, <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's actually also one of the reasons that, uh, you know, a student athlete, like a varsity student athlete, you know, uh, statistically do so well um, in school because their time is regimented and because they don't have the time to waste. You mm -hmm. can waste time really quickly and easily when it isn't as regimented because you have other, you know, you have teammates that are counting on you to, uh, to be academically successful as well. And that you are a naturally wired to be really driven and, and want to, uh, you know, want to be successful. So, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it. Um, it, I think that's part of what helps, you know, uh, varsity and, and elite athletes become successful in all sorts of walks of life. You know, some of the guys and, and different athletes that I've worked with that are transitioning out, they, they also don't necessarily realize the skill sets that they have, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the soft skills that they've learned and that are going to be incredibly <laughs> valuable um, in any sort of profession and that they can transition into other roles to cite not maybe not, not necessarily having, you know, those those specific um, experiences in, in a given field, but they are just so adaptable. So, you know, I, um, like I said, I, I, uh, I was, I got great advice, you know, early on about my career and when I was thinking about it. And, um, you know, my wife was, was always really uh, supportive, but also drove me to be thinking about those things. You know, what was I going to do post football? You know, it could end at any time. How are you going to set yourself up for the long term? Um, and when I was thinking about what I wanted to do and, and, and where I wanted to go, you know, Michael Pinball Clemens gave me the best advice. This is in my second year or two, you know, and I was thinking about, do I want to do graduate school? Do I want to, you know, what kind of role would I want to have? Or what kind of job would I want to have post football? And he said, you know, figure out what you love to do and make that a career. And that was like one of the most, um, you know, striking, honest statements I think anyone had ever said. It was like, yeah, that, that absolutely makes sense. And, you know, I thought about it and now what didn't want to be a coach or a professional coach. I love coaching and I, I coach several teams now, but, you know, my kids and, and youth sports, but, um, you know, sports business was it. I was really interested in that. I had started to work with the players union um, and, and I was really interested in the business challenges and, and uh, that being a way to be involved in sport. And uh, I went out and found, um, you know, reached out to some some people in uh, in in around the Hamilton area. Um, Ward Dills, uh, who was the executive director at OUA, which is a, was a Hamilton based at the time. Uh, Trez Quigley at Mac and mm -hmm. had kind of informational interviews and and others as well. And, and it turned into some job opportunities. And I, I decided to take one with the OUA and just kind of work as a you know assistant and coordinator type role. And um, I ended up doing that for. Uh, eight years in total and five years during my playing career that I worked full time for Ontario University Athletics uh, as an administrator while playing football full time. And that was a lot of work. It was a heavy load, but it allowed me to, when it was time to retire mm -hmm. from the CFL to essentially close the chapter on that and walk right into the next chapter. And um, I think it helped, you know, helped me advance my career, you know, more quickly than it would, would have otherwise. And, you know, to the people that were at the OUA ward and, you know, board members and athletic directors of the other schools that also were very supportive of allowing me to, mm -hmm. you know, manage my time between those two commitments of football and, and, and the office. So, 
um, you know, I owe a lot to a lot of those sorts of people that helped you along the way. Uh, you know, in addition to the, all those coaches, uh, those administrators that helped me get started. Well, probably a great example to so many people in that audience, in that office, sorry, that people that are seeing you execute both of those those uh, passions, we'll call it, of the business aspect of sport and executing sport in itself and the daily grinds of it all. Where did the Canada basketball come from? <laughs> Yeah, um, that's, you know, my career path has been interesting in that I've ended up in a number of sports that I wasn't necessarily involved in <laughs> prior. Um, working at the OUA was a, just, you know, the best kind of training ground I could have asked for. 23 sports for men and women, 40 championships, you know, 10,000 student athletes, like a big organization with such a diversity. Um, and having the chance to work on all these different sports with all these different leaders within those sports from the NSOs to the PSOs, coaches and so forth. So um, I had been, as I said, eight years working at, uh, at the OUA, uh, three years kind of in senior leadership there, uh, including serving as the executive director for a period of time. Um, so I had worked in basketball and hockey and football and in all the sports. And uh, I, um, through my work in basketball, um, kind of caught the attention of Michelle O'Keefe who was the uh, CEO at Canada Basketball at the time. And she was looking to uh, backfill a position that she had left. Uh, she was uh, had moved into the CEO position and the, the president position and uh, added my name to a search uh, list for a uh, recruiting uh, agency. Uh, and um, they called me up about the job and mm -hmm. it was intriguing at the time. And I wanted to, you know, obviously learn more. And so I got involved in that process and, and uh, you know, found my way over to Canada Basketball. And I had a really fantastic uh, four years I spent there. We built out a, you know, a, a new business plan and a new hosting plan and we hosted, uh, they hadn't hosted many events if, if at all really in, in a couple decades. And we hosted several dozen events over the course of those couple years. Uh, a FIBA U18 championship just down the road mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in St. Catharines and senior men's qualifying and senior women's events and, and all sorts of things, 3x3 basketball. And, and that was really great to build a strategy out from scratch uh, together and, and really help put Canada basketball in a, in a better position than it had been. It had traditionally, unfortunately, had struggling, struggled, uh, financially struggled. The business was challenged. And um, I think we, we put it in a really good place. And, uh, and they have run with that uh, since then um, and, uh, and have started to build even more success that uh, aligned with the success of the players that we, mm -hmm. we'd already seen that happening at a player level. The men and the women were already achieving great results for you know, a couple decades now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we were able to align the business to, to better support their success. And, and subsequently it has just you know, continued to, to grow and excel since then. So, you know, coming into the sport also, it was really beneficial. And I've also seen that in my current job that, you know, I had a bit of a wider lens, a bit of a more holistic approach um, that was because I was from outside of the sport that I would look at the challenges and relate them to other sports organizations, uh, other businesses and companies sure. to understand that, you know, the challenges, they're people challenges, you know, they're strategy challenges. Um, they're not necessarily unique to that sport. Um, and I think that served, you know, served me very well and has served the companies I've worked for uh, well as, and, as well. Well, and that's the thing now. So now you're, you're right in trenched in Gulf Canada right now. Yeah. And in what, you, what very much like basketball, <clears throat> we're seeing more and more successful golfers coming from this country than we ever have. Yeah. And that's a kind of aligns with the basketball too. And I think that's gotta be a proud thing for Golf Canada right now that there is succeeding in all age groups and all genders as well. Yeah, of course. I, you know, I mean, Canada basketball, you really looked at the impact of Steve Nash and, and the Raptors and Vince Carter that drove a wave of basketball players. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you look at the history of immigration, especially in this area in the GTA, you know, that that has driven the success. You know, people that were coming from places that didn't necessarily, you know, they were from places that played basketball and soccer and, and, and communities that that uh, that were engaged in those sports. So I think that um, you know, that helped drive that success and then it just compounded, right? And, you know, programs develop and the high performance program at Canada Basketball develops and the Ontario Basketball Association develops and, and more and more playing opportunities and high level playing opportunities and, and those sorts of things. So um, I, I think that that, you know, that was kind of indicative with all of those factors. 
And, you know, golf's not dissimilar. You know, uh, the guys that are on tour now are from the Mike Weir tree. You know, Mike Weir winning the Masters and being one of the most dominant golfers in the world for people just remember the Masters, but he was he was one of the <coughs> best players in the world for a three year period of time. Absolutely. When Tiger was at his mm -hmm. peak powers and Mike was Mike was one of the beat him in Montreal. Two or three best players. Remember exactly. That? So, you know, that inspired a lot of a lot of guys and I think um, helped Canada uh, helped Golf Canada progress and and I think the the staff that's been in place in the last um, you know 10 years has you know just leaned into the programming and built more and more and as you see there's Canadian in the hunt basically every single week mm -hmm. Canadians winning on tour you know Brooke is the most successful Canadian player of all time and what she's done for the women's game and all of that has just continued to to build mm -hmm. uh, golf in this country you know COVID uh, it was a and as unfortunate it was, and it was certainly not uh, ideal for those of us that run run events, mm -hmm. but it was uh, a boon for golf and uh, in this country in participation, more and more people participating. Um, and uh, we've been able to want launch programs that have just continued to expand, uh, you know, the number of people playing golf in this country. It's clear that, you know, it's one of the most participated sports in this country, and it's not close. You know, millions of people that play golf in this country, millions of rounds every year that are that are played. We have more facilities per capita than anywhere else in the world. Golf courses everywhere in Oakville, Burlington, Hamilton. It's public crazy. and private municipal courses, and 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 so and golf in all different ways. And so that's the you know that's the great thing about our sport as well is that it's also the really the only sport that you play for life. Mm -hmm. You can start playing when you're a kid and you play all the way and you know you shoot your age when you're 95. Mm -hmm. You know and and that's there aren't any other sports that are like that um, and that's what's pretty special about it we've launched a campaign this year golf and health and really focusing on the uh, you know celebrating the benefits to your health of golf you know mental and physical and um and and that's that's the reality of the sport that it just brings so much value to uh, people's lives and that's ultimately why you know those of us that work in sport work in sport because it improves people's life and it improves our communities and and ultimately the country as a whole so we're proud to be you know proud to be part of it proud to have seen a canadian win the rbc can open last year we're you know proud to see them have success on the tours each year and uh, you know we set a pretty lofty goal to see you know 30 canadians on the pga and lpga tours by 2032 and continue to be the you know the uh, the biggest source of professional golf talent in the world next to the U.S. And we you know they the, the U.S. was the only country that won more PJ Tour tournaments last year than Canadians did. Mm -hmm. So wow, um, I didn't know that. We're proud of that, and I think you see that across Canadian sports as a whole. Mm -hmm. Right, you you see success. We've had record Olympic after rec, rec, record Olympics. I think Vancouver was a big launching point for that. Um, and what they did uh, with Van Ock and, and the Own the Podium program that was introduced to win the Olympics and for us to, as a country, to transition to say, we're going to win. We want to win the Olympics. Like, Canada would never have said that before then. And never. I think that was a really bold decision uh, by the COC and those that supported the programming. And ultimately, it was successful. And it was successful in London and it was successful in Brazil. And it's been successful, you know, since then, uh, each and every year, more and more team sports that have now found their way uh, into the Olympic Games. You see both the men and women's basketball teams this year. You see the success of volleyball and rugby and obviously Shea the Gilbert's soccer Alexander. program. Yeah, and Shea here, Hamiltonian, right? He is one of the best players in the NBA. Uh, led our team this past summer uh, to to a medal at the uh, World Cup and, and will be absolutely in the hunt for a medal at the Olympics. Uh, they play, the uh, Canadian men play the U.S. men in a, uh, in a pre-tournament pre game in Vegas in the summer, and that will be can't-miss TV to see our NBA players playing, you know, what is a dream team um, or the dream team. And um, they'll, they will be in, the, in it bucket for bucket. So I, I would think so. I mean, and I think that's exciting for for sports fans, not just basketball fans, but sports fans <clears throat> all around. Now, we, we talk about the, your job, your present job right now as tournament director. And I'm going to ask you a, a wide question here, but it is kind of, I think, what a lot of people want to know. What does a tournament director do for, at yeah. the Canadian Open? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Lots of people that uh, don't necessarily, you know, uh, know about, know the ins and outs of the event or, or the event business. You know, well, what do you do the rest of the year? <laughs> I work on this golf tournament 365 days a year. Uh, we have a staff of seven on the operations side that work on this tournament and our women's tournament. Uh, we have uh, 
five in our sales team that just sell the tournament. We have seven on the partnership side. We have a dozen in marketing communications, all of these folks. Now, some of those departments do multiple things uh, across uh, Gulf Canada and all the business uh, kind of uh, uh, streams that we have. But, uh, you know, for me personally, it's, it's overseeing, a, you know, overseeing what is a, essentially a small business, you know, that has a multi-million dollar budget. We have, you know, 130 plus thousand people attend to 2,300 volunteers. We build 200,000 square feet of hosting space. And wow. Grandstands, all those sorts of things. It's, like, it's a construction project. It's a people management project. It's a stakeholder relations project. So, you know, we have um, dozens of par 28 partners uh, with RB being the title of course uh, we work with our host clubs like the Hamilton Golf Country Club uh, Oakdale Golf Country Club St. George's uh, Country Club that um, we hosted at in 2022 so um, you have a lot of stakeholders and a lot of people that are, are invested in it and you know the planning that goes into delivering you know this one week you know takes the year we're working on 25 and 26 already and and doing all those uh, sorts of pieces so um, it's just a really about managing that uh, making sure that everybody is pointed in the same direction, mm -hmm. everybody has a shared common vision, um, and and they understand their missions and mandates uh, to deliver the event and why you know why we're doing it and right. and that's 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 really what it's about and it's I get to be creative every day and 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 how we tackle challenges and solve problems mm -hmm. and and uh, ideate to make the experience even better for all of the fans that uh, and our clients that come. Well, and Hamilton, I guess for the seventh time now, will host the, the, the Canadian Open, and it will be in your hometown uh, at the Hamilton yeah. Golf and Country Club, and I think that's got to be something that, that, that you're proud about. And I guess there's been some course, course changes uh, to, to the course since, uh, I guess, 2019 was the last time when Rory McIlroy was the winner here. Uh, talk to me about the challenge for this uh, brand of golfers that will be coming up, and the field as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, uh, it is absolutely one of the very best courses in the country. And I think, you know, people in, in the Hamilton Golden Horseshoe area, you know, don't probably understand how great of a golf course it is. And it was great before and they renovated it in 2020 uh, and 2021. And it is absolutely world class. You know, some of the things that they did, they expanded all the greens, created more runoffs. Uh, they redid all of their bunkers, added tees, changed some of the contouring, um, a little bit of a, a return to the uh, traditional Harry Colt design. Um, you know, they a lot of uh, golf courses have also kind of thinned out some of the trees and those sorts of things for you know better airflow and be able to see your golf course uh, better than you know what had become you know really traditional Parkland style courses that were you know how were tree lined the whole way through you couldn't see the other holes that sort of thing. So most most of those kind of northern traditional Parkland style courses have gone that direction. But uh, they did a masterful job uh, renovating that property. Uh, it was recognized as the uh, best renovation uh, of the year in the world by Golf Digest. Wow. last year so um, it's spectacular um, it definitely is playing harder than it was playing before certainly for members and it will be for uh, the professional players uh, as well mm -hmm. um, so we're we're excited to be able to actually you know bring the PJ Tour back to this course and see it now uh, in, in its new glory. And um, it's one of the best properties, not only inside the ropes, but outside the ropes for us too. It's a large property, you know, 300 acres mm -hmm. with the three nines and practice facility and large driving range and really just has everything that uh, we need. Every, every property is different and has its own challenges. And, and certainly uh, this one has some challenges as well, but you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, all the ingredients you need to host a, a successful PJ tour event, uh, the Hamilton Golf Country Club definitely is one of them. And they're a membership that's been, you know, amazingly supportive of this championship. Mm -hmm. We're really part of our, you know, change in mold in 2019. You know, we really changed the event from 18 to 19. Um, when the date changed and with RBC's investments and, and support that it, 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 it went to another level uh, that year. And, uh, and the Hamilton Golf Country Club was part of that and, um, you know, part of helping us achieve that. And, and we've gone on a great run of success since then. And, and we'll have what we expect to be another record breaking year uh, this year back back in Hampton. And and you talk about the date change and, and I guess I guess the golfers right now, I mean everyone's making their personal schedule. And I guess this is gonna be kind of a I guess also like last year, tee up to the US Open, I guess, for a lot of these golfers. Yeah, we're we'll attending. Where we fall in the schedule. So we're actually uh, uh, one week earlier than we've been the last couple of years at the end of May, beginning of June uh, now. 
Um, so we're kind of right in the thick of, of a really great time of the year for golf with the RBC Key Open, uh, followed by the Memorial Championship, mm -hmm. which is Jack Nicklaus's uh, event in uh, Dublin, Ohio, mm -hmm. U.S. Open, uh, and then they head up to Travelers in Connecticut, and then off to off to uh, the U.K. for the Scottish and the um, uh, in the Open Championship as well. Uh, you know, a little bit after that so uh it's a great week in nor of northern events and and really historic championships as well with ourselves and memorial and the u.s open and travelers is a great event in, in uh, connecticut um so uh so that that's kind of been part of the as the schedule's grown and evolved and changed over the last number of years and is still kind of a, a you know an ongoing project mm -hmm. uh for our friends uh at the pj tour um you know we we love you know being at the beginning of the summer beginning of the golf season, you know, we're, we're a kickoff to summer. We, we phrased it summer's open, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a few years back. And, and this is when, you know, people are really, you know, getting back into golf here in the spring and summer and, and, you know, kind of before school, everything's now. still green. Everything is very, very <laughs> green. Um, you know, and so, yeah, we, we kind of relish the opportunity to mm -hmm. kick off summer and that's what the event's all about too, is mm -hmm. being outside and enjoying the weather and enjoying, uh, friends and great food. And, um, you know, we launched our concert series back in 2019 that we've done every year since then, um, that we host on the Friday and Saturday night. Well, we're going to get uh, to that. Right? Gonna, so I'll hold on that. We're, we're, we're going to get to that, but it's, it's, it's a you know it's a shared experience for people and you know I encourage people that aren't even necessarily golf fans mm -hmm. that you know they're gonna have a great day mm -hmm. you got the Canadians involved I, I'm presuming Nick will be back to defend his title oh right, right? Yeah, he'll yeah. be back and, and you'll have guys like McKenzie from Dundas here they'll be looking to to, yeah. to take, take that title from him as well too and some of the best in the world will be here in, in yeah Hamilton. of course you know Rory uh, McElroy will be back to try to defend his title from Hamilton and yeah I guess really eh? you know so we've got the defending champ at this course and the defending champ from the year before um you know rory winning back to back in two different courses is pretty unique uh, as well in 2019 and then a couple years later after covid in 22 to do it again um but uh, yeah of course all of those canadian players you, you mentioned mac and uh cory connors of course yeah. as well and we'll have a, somewhere between 20, 20 to 25 canadians that will be in the field as a whole we have a national qualifying system like that's a great thing about the open like literally any canadian could qualify for the RBC Canadian Open, um, and, and and that's what's special about it is a national championship. Um, so you know you have all those Canadians that'll be vying to try to be uh, the next guy and keep a, keep get a streak going of Canadians winning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know Rory McIlroy, as you mentioned, we have uh, the great fortune of having Team RBC um, that uh, you know uh, represent uh, the bank and are some of the They're best loaded players. loaded Saeed field. Sagala. Yeah, say Sagala. Um, uh, uh, Cam Young, of course, being another one, Sam Burns. And then, uh, you know, we'll have some other really exciting players that we'll announce in the coming weeks that will all, all be in the field uh, as well. You know, and, and it's turned into, and I've really noticed what you guys have done, and I think this is sport right now, is that there's the event and then there's plus, plus, plus yeah. to difference, to, to, to make a difference out there and say, you're not just coming to see this. Well, you got a Waterdown native also involved as well, too. And uh, uh, Our Lady Peace, Josh Ross, as we're seeing here, they're going to be putting on a show, individual nights, and this has become really the core of the Canadian Open. And, you know, you buy a ticket to see golf, you're also going to see some other entertainment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the whole strategy was to uh, make the event about more than just golf, make it a sport and entertainment property that would engage with different audiences, expand golf to to reach different people, different demographics. And, and that was the goal um, when we started that um, with RBC in, in 2019. And we're really fortunate to have Sirius XM uh, Canada come on board and, and be a partner the last couple of years and be our presenting partner of the concert series this coming year. Um, and and it has opened up the tournament to people that wouldn't have come otherwise. And, uh, you know, can't tell you the number of stories I've heard about people that, you know, came uh, for the golf and stayed for the music or people that came <laughs> for the music. <laughs> But came early and saw the golf, mm -hmm. and um, and we've seen that that the people that are coming to the event, you know, we've had fifteen, twenty thousand for a couple of different of our, uh, sets of our artists in the past that uh, have been there, and the majority have all been there early in the afternoon and seen the event as a whole, and and realize that wow, this is like an awesome party <laughs> to mm -hmm. be part of, uh, and we've done some great things with a food initiative and our and our uh, and our food partners and our uh, beverage partners, mm -hmm. um, and uh, all of our other partners, activations and experiences that are on site, and and really making it a 
a great day for people to engage with. You know, uh, one of our partners, the Score Bet, uh, has done some amazing things mm-hmm. when it comes to activations. They did these seats in the sky, 150 feet in the sky back in 2022. They did this experience to play a golf hole uh, right on site uh, last year, and they've got a really cool mm-hmm. idea coming this year that uh, we'll announce in a, in a few weeks' time. So mm-hmm. we've got a whole bunch of things that uh, partners are doing that are really exciting and, and different and unique, and um, and that's that's really what it's about: appeal to different audiences, appeal to um, to as broad a spectrum as we possibly can, and introduce them to the sport of golf, and hopefully get them to engage in golf in different ways throughout the year uh, as well. Uh, this year, you know, we we intentionally really leaned into the Canadiana with the defending champion Nick Taylor. We have an all Canadian lineup for our, our, our music. Uh, and you mentioned Josh Ross, uh, a local a local guy and, and one of the you know hottest artists Huge. in Canada right now, just exploding on the country music scene. And um, we're really excited to have uh, to have him uh, as well as Our Lady Peace celebrating their 30th anniversary of Naveed and wow. you know, one of the greatest selling Canadian rock bands of all time. You know, I think they had five straight multi platinum albums and mm-hmm. and uh, one of the most awarded Canadian art acts of all time. So uh, that's want to really, hear the hits. No, you know? like and 19, 19 top ten singles they had wow. 19 unbelievable so people are really excited about them and uh, we'll, we'll be announcing uh, artists that'll be playing those nights with them as well uh, in uh, probably just about a week or so's time so uh, there'll be exciting additional acts that'll be uh, be taking the stage those nights and some other special surprises that we've got to uh, to announce uh, over the next uh, couple weeks as well so the event uh, the event's growing and getting bigger and and the demand has been there and and um, we've been lucky to receive uh, the support from you know all sorts of different uh, uh, stakeholders and sectors to allow us to just continue to grow this in the in the right way. It's a lot of teasing going on here by just our, a, our just tournament a, director. Just here, a little guys. bit of teasing. Yeah, just a teasing here. Hey, one other thing that I think is just spectacular about this. Hey, uh, the Waste Man- Management Open on yeah. the PGA, they have developed this hole with a stadium size par three. And people, it's not even golf. It's like another world. People lose their minds. At times they get maybe a little too rowdy. But you've also modeled something that in one of your holes uh, that I think fans will really really appreciate yeah the uh, i mean double a wm phoenix open is an absolute uh, spectacle and i recommend it to anybody who is a sports fan that it is a bucket list sporting event mm-hmm. um that you know you've gotta gotta get to at some point uh, in your life it's incredible what they've done there um you know i have very close colleagues uh down at wm phoenix open now and have been to to see the event um, and uh, we've taken some great things uh, from them and, and tried to apply it to the Canadian Open in our, in our uh, own unique way that yeah. is authentic to what the RBC Canadian Open is, is all about and what our national championship all is all about. Um, and what we've been growing is is the rink hole, which you referenced mm-hmm. earlier. And so this was a, this was a, a you know, a brilliant idea, you know, that predates uh, me, so I can't take any credit for, for the concept that, uh, and it was part of uh, celebrating uh, Canada's uh, 150th. Uh, where they themed one of the golf holes, a par three, around hockey. Uh, brought in rink boards and uh, Marshall Gallery Management uh, were in referee jerseys and there's Zamboni and goalie master tee blocks and, and all this sort of stuff. And it was really great at Glen Abbey and, and successful. And uh, when we went to leave Glen Abbey, there was some thought about, you know, does this continue on? Was it kind of just, you know, a one-time thing? And, um, and uh you know, when I saw it for the first time, I was like, we got to double down on, on this. It's the, the challenge that we have moving around golf courses is we don't have the marquee hole like like uh, like in Phoenix or um, like in Ponte Vedra at the Players' Championship with the yes. Island Green. Or you, when you're at the same golf course every year, which every event on tour outside of the, the majors that travel and outside of the w, uh, BMW Championship is at the same golf course every single year. So we're really unique in that we, we travel around a rota. And so when you don't have that you know, that marquee hole every year. And that's not to say the golf courses don't because every golf course has marquee holes, but they, they're not as notable because we're not there every single year. Sure. The rink hole really has become that marquee hole for us. And it's been on all different, it was on 16 uh, at St. George's, it's been on 13, it's been on 14. It's been all different places. Uh, and at Hamilton, it's on number 13. And um, so we said, you know, we got to kind of double down and grow this. And it 
every year has just grown and grown and grown. Mm -hmm. More partners that are activating on it and mm -hmm. doing more things for general admission spectators, uh, more hospitality clients on it. Uh, we've got a double decker tent that's being built on it oh. this year for the first time. Uh, so it's just gotten bigger and bigger. The broadcast has leaned into it. You know, mm -hmm. Colt and Amanda are on, mm -hmm. on set uh, right there on Sundays. Uh, you know, the fans have, have embraced it, uh, you know, wearing their Canadian gear and singing Oh Canada when the Canadians come onto the tee and mm -hmm. making it a fun environment. And the thing that I love about our Canadian fans is they understand golf in a way that, you know, that we could only really dream of them understanding it because they, they know how to have a great time and make this the fun event that it's meant to be while still respecting the traditions and the history and norm of golf. And so they know when to be quiet, they know when mm -hmm. to make noise, and they know how to make it a great experience for everybody, you know, the players and fans alike. So um, the rink has been, you know, a real, uh, you know, a real signature for the RBC Kilpin over the last number of years. And, and, uh, we're really proud of it. And, and for those people that, you know, that were bold enough to say, yeah, let's put hockey boards around a golf hole and, <laughs> and, and do that, you know, the, the, the result has been probably beyond their wildest dreams. And I think the best part about that too, because it really, it could, <laughs> It might not work if the golfers didn't buy in too, right? Because they, you know, they're laser focused, and yes, it's the crowds are maybe a little bit more on a particular hole, almost tiger-like, really, in some senses. But they are rowdy and they are having fun, and you know, just enjoying the tournament. Hopefully, it's a great day too, which I think amplifies it all. But the golfer has to buy in too to the atmosphere, and that the, it, this may not be like every other hole on the golf course. Absolutely, and, and I think that that's you know there's been more and more of that on the PGA Tour you know I referenced uh, the Island Green uh, at TPC Sawgrass earlier and and you know players have bought into you know these unique holes that are uh, that are exciting and challenging for them and 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 you know for the fans as well and um, we've seen you know some players want to get the crowd into it and they're mm -hmm. comfortable some players aren't yeah. as comfortable but um, that's that's what's important you know on, in our pro-am days and early in the week we see the players they'll don the NHL jerseys of their hometown teams and mm -hmm. we do lots of things that are you know tied to, to hockey and and they've leaned into it and and understand that that's what is one of the things that is really special mm -hmm. uh, about our about our event and you know bringing a little canadiana to it and 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 leaning into you know what is part of our better nature is 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 pretty special well if you're going to put if you're going to walk around with a Vancouver Canucks jersey on you're going to get booed yeah, like I just mean, that's, that's just the reality of it for not, the most maybe part. not so much as the as the Habs jersey <laughs> oh yeah and luckily sure. a lot of the american <laughs> players you know they're wearing uh, predators jerseys <laughs> or they're wearing florida panthers jerseys which i guess during the playoffs could be uh, could be a bad idea, but uh, you know a lot of those guys are from uh, you know southern states, and they were the ones where you know Leaf fans aren't as uh, don't have as much vitriol for those teams as they do if they were wearing a Canadian no doubt or, you know Bruins jersey or something. Hey, let me throw. I'm going to put you on the spot here. I mean, I, I'm amazed at when the when the crowds are going wild like that, and the things that come out of particular fans' mouths right after a drive or an approach shot. Like to me, the one is mashed potatoes. Mashed, ba -ba <laughs> like, like, are you amazed by that? What fans come up with? Yeah, I mean, you know, some of it's really dumb. <laughs> I mean, but you know, every once in a while, and it was like this when you know when I was in the CFL, and you'd stand on the sidelines and you'd uh, you'd be standing there and you got your back to the crowd and most of the time you don't hear anything that uh, is really being said directly but you know on occasion you do hear the specifics or um, and uh, you know you'd be standing there pretending not to listen and then pretending not to laugh because what they did say was really funny <laughs> and uh yeah it's uh you know it's it's a funny kind labor of, day at Iverwind. oh yeah labor day at Iverwind. they're you know chirping you know pinball was the greatest for engaging with the fans like as much as if they tried to chirp and they couldn't like they couldn't do it like he just was you know too engaging and um certainly you know i was uh, in, in uh, 2006 played with ricky williams that year and there was a lot of really creative things that people did uh for ricky us williams yeah who was by the way a like one of the best teammates he was a fabulous really, eh? teammate hard worker yeah. was great was uh great to spend a year with him and get to be friends mm -hmm. and uh 
Yeah, he made an appearance. We went shopping at Lime Ridge Mall one, uh, one afternoon. Yeah, yeah, There's Ricky Williams. <laughs> That's basically what happened about 45 minutes into it. And then it was like, you know, it was like it was announced over the PA or something. He was swarmed and he's like, let, you know, get out of here as fast as possible. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was, you know, arguably one of the, you know, most notable athletes in the world at the time. You know, Absolutely. Just come on, you know, the 60 Absolutely. minutes thing. And yep. he was, he was pretty, pretty notable, but um, he was, like I said, I have nothing but great things to say about him as a, as a teammate. Let me, let's ask you a question here because you, I mean, you would understand this more than anyone else. And, and I think this is just what's going on with golf right now. Um, where are we? Or at least your opinions about what's going on with golf and the the two leagues and, you know, where we may go in the future. And I don't know your thoughts about that. Yeah, it's tough. I I don't know. It's tough for me because I love golf. Right. And I see some pluses with live, but I know PGA is the standard. Yeah, I mean, it's it certainly has, uh, you know, created uh, an environment that has been less than ideal uh, for golf over mm-hmm. the last uh, three years. And our tournament's been kind of at the forefront of a lot of it. You know, in 22, oh my. the first live event was the same weekend. And, you know, I think our our event spoke for itself when, uh, when people looked at what the product uh, had to offer. Uh, and we were at the front of it again last year when they announced the framework agreement. And once again, the product kind of took over and and at the end of the day it was about what was being done inside the ropes and the finish that we had and and uh so i was really proud to to kind of be the the standard bearer you know those two uh two moments um i uh you know i have a role with the pj tour as a chair of the tournament advisory council and it's a council that uh, represents all the tournaments to the pj tour and and so have been close to it over the last couple of years and, and in my role as the chair in the last year uh, or last several months anyways. Um, but at the same time, uh, also, you know, uh, are kind of like everybody else wondering where, you know, where it's going to go and, and how it's going to, um, you know, ultimately play out. It has certainly created, you know, massive change uh, and upheaval across the, the golf landscape and, and our, you know, the competition has been good to force us to improve and, and do things better and, and think differently about things, which, which we have been doing as a, as a PGA tour. Um, you know, there is no question that the PGA tour is the premier, you know, golf league in the world. Um, there are great players that, uh, you know, play on other tours, but this is the collection of the best players. It has the most consistent pipeline of great new players, mm-hmm. um, and um, and and they've worked very hard to do that. You know, they've PJ Tour Americas with PJ Tour Canada as part of that, and the Corn mm-hmm. Ferry Tour and PJ Tour University, and, and all those sorts of things that have developed those stars. The the infrastructure of broadcast and media reach, and all of the pieces that you know um, help bring uh, develop golfers and help bring them into the homes of of people around the world, kind of you know every week. Um, and you know, the tour is going to continue to do those things. I I'm hopeful, like everyone else, that we find a way that we can you know. Um, kind of all coexist and all work together and, and drive the sport of golf and inspire more people to um, to to join the sport and and participate in the ways that um, there are to participate, whether it be you know recreationally for 18 or nine holes or driving ranges or, or what have you, putting courses, those sorts of things. Um, so that that I think you know I think that ultimately you know there'll be a, a, a resolution and and they'll find a way to to make golf work and golf grow because there's tons of opportunities for it here in North America and and even more opportunities perhaps internationally um, as well so uh, like everyone you know I'm I'm eager to see us get to a place where we start to continue to move forward and spend more time working on making our product better and making the game better um, and um, and and you know winning back some fans that have maybe been turned off of of it being so much about the business um, of the sport in recent point. years. Yeah, you know, it's it's tough because, you know, I, I don't like seeing Rory put on the spot. I mean, he was this week. Yeah. I mean, $850 million offer. Where'd that come from? But it's rumors, right? Yeah. And, it's, and he's, un, he's unequivocally said that, you know, he's going to play on the PGA Absolutely. Tour until right. he no longer plays uh, professional golf. And, you know, Rory has been an unbelievable spokesperson for the game. Um, and it's in some cases been, you know, to his own detriment that he's had to carry that burden. Mm-hmm. Um, and But he has done it and done it will, willingly. And he is like 
an absolutely tremendous person. He's do does it for the right reasons, believes in the right things, um, is an incredible spokesperson. You know, I've been so proud to have him be a spokesperson of our tournament uh, as our past champion. Um, and and so you know we're we're lucky to have a guy like that. I I'm not someone who would ever begrudge any player who's decided to um, take another opportunity. Um, because they think it's the best one for their family, and that's that's their that's their choice. Um, I think what the PJ Tour has to offer, you know, professional golfers uh, far exceeds what any other uh, tour has to offer, and and um, and I think that um, you know we've we've proven that, and we've adjusted and grown and expanded and and done the right things, and um, and as I said, hopefully you know there's a way that we can see all the best players you know in the world playing together more often, and mm-hmm. and uh, it's exciting when that's when that's the case, right? Well, there's no doubt about that because uh, I want to see Brooks and I. I want to see uh, John Rahm, and, and I, I feel like they belong. And when, and when we get these Masters yeah. and, and the other major championships, and it's like, okay, this is more normal. And, this is what I'm accustomed to. And all players that have played at the RBC Canadian Open. Exactly. Um, you know, those are both those players and, and many others. They've all been at the RBC Canadian Open over the years, and many of them, many of them multiple years. And, um, you know, so, we, yeah, we want, to see, we want to see all those guys, um, you know, have fans of golf around the world have an opportunity to see them play and and tournaments that are meaningful you know I think that is that's you know golf is about legacy you know professional golf is about legacy you know perhaps even more than almost any other professional sport and um, you know our tournaments have history and heritage and and certainly the one that uh, that I get to be part of has more history and heritage than almost any tournament on the planet with the exception of the U.S. Open and the Open Championship that are just a little bit older Mm -hmm. and that that means something you know it means something that every great in golf has won the RBC King Open with the exception of Jack who re- looks at it as, as his you know, greatest failure was never winning the King Open and being runner up as many times as he was. Designed Arnold, Glenn Abbey. Arnold Palmer's first win yep. as a PJ Tour, um, the first professional win um, at Weston and you know you mentioned John Rahm his first professional start on the PJ Tour as you know at the RBC King Open and many others uh, and that would call him Morikawa and many others um that uh, that you know that are part of the history and heritage of our of our tournament and 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 that you know that means something and and it means something to to be a system where you you know you win your way along and uh, I think that's also what's unique about golf and what people love about the sport as well that you've got to earn it every single week it's not an easy it's not an easy job not an easy job at all for uh, for these professional golfers week in and week out well we certainly appreciate what you're doing for this tournament, putting it into the upper stratospheres of the tournaments that can't be missed on the PGA Tour. Um, We all care about the Canadian Open. It's a national open. And the fact that it's being held right here in our own backyard makes it even sweeter. Because I know the events, as you said, the the year that Rory won, the year that Jim Furyk won, I heard nothing but good things from about the course and the way it was run uh, from the golfers and just interviewing them and just seeing the crowds. And uh, I, I can't wait. Um, it's a big date for you. I know lots of planning still yet right. to come. And uh, we really appreciate you taking an hour out here to, oh, to join you. us here on this podcast. And not only talk about the things with, the, with Golf Canada and the things you've accomplished, but uh, the things that were are just amazing that set you up for where you are today, too, because uh, I certainly do remember number 40 on the football field wearing double blue and having those mixed feelings about you playing with, with the Toronto Argonauts. But Brian Crawford, congratulations on all what you've put together and uh, uh, continued success and uh, look forward to you got a free pass for me or at least a media pass uh, for I me. Think we could work you hook me up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Bubba. Thanks for joining us, Thank Brian. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, that's your Sports Line podcast for the day. And as you've just seen and heard, we love talking to sports, especially people that are making a difference in our area. If you do know of an athlete, team, or event to promote the Sports Line podcast, do want to hear from you. Hit that thumbs up, like, and subscribe button. And be sure to check out the other CHCH podcasts like Trending Now and Newsmakers with Louis Butko. For the talented people that make the Sports Line pos- uh, podcast possible, thank you so very much. And we'll see you tomorrow.